This episode of the Fine Home Building Podcast is brought to you by Zip System Building Enclosures. Regular listeners of the Fine Home Building Podcast have heard us mention Zip System Building Enclosures, the integrated sheathing and sealing solution system providing a streamlined approach to exterior water, air, and thermal management. But they may not be aware of the multiple resources available to builders with application or installation questions. Huberwood.com has the install detail library and access to the technical information team. How-to information is also available on the Zip System YouTube channel and on Instagram and TikTok by following at Huberwood. Why do we have to do this partial one quarter of our rough in and then get it inspected? <laughs> and the, the electrical inspector came the other day and I only have three wires up there, you know, gutter heaters and some soffit lighting. And uh, he's kind of going, where's the, <laughs> what am I inspecting? Welcome to the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast, our regular discussion with building industry professionals. This is Fine Home Building Contributing Editor and Production Manager at TDS Custom Construction, Ian Schwant. Today, I am joined by owner and director of good things at Capra Home Concepts, Keegan McAuliffe. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast and the original Fine Home Building podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can leave feedback and ask questions there too. Keegan, it's great to have you on. Yeah, thanks Ian, excited to be here. So tell us about your background in the trades and how you came to start your own business. And uh, I've got to know where the title of director of good things came from. <laughs> yeah, uh, I grew up, my dad was a contractor um, and did custom homes, built custom homes in Northern California. And so kind of was around it my whole life. Uh, did a little bit of, you know, picking up trash on job sites in high school and uh we didn't really get into actually building anything um went to junior college and didn't have much of a focus uh there but just was taking classes and then ended up uh choosing to do the culinary arts program there um so i got certificates in in all the culinary arts at that jc in northern cal and went into that field, got into a nice restaurant, was working in fine dining for a few years. <laughs> and uh, that world, it's just an interesting world. Your wife's a chef, I'm sure I'm sure you know some of that. Um, but mostly it was working late nights, weekends, holidays, uh, very minimal pay. And so all of a sudden, <laughs> uh, the trades kind of I, you know, started talking to some of my dad's friends who were contractors and uh, kind of made that transition back after three years in food service. And uh, it was, it was awesome because I got to work, you know, seven to four on Monday through Friday. <laughs> and all, it seemed like a total treat and the money was way better right off the bat. So um that's, I guess I kind of went back into the trades and had a, a really good appreciation for what the trades have to offer um, because food service, as much as I love it and I still love to cook, uh, it's a pretty brutal industry and especially the schedule and the, the hours and everything. So um, then we moved to Idaho. My wife and I moved up here about five years ago and uh, that's when I got my license and was working for another contractor for a while and then uh, went fully on my own about three, three, four years ago. Um, and we've been, I've been doing custom homes here in Sandpoint, Idaho since then. Are you doing mostly remodeling work or are you building a lot of uh, new projects? I'm, I'm loving the new construction and we've had such a building boom up here and so many uh, new people moving over from California and from Seattle and uh, all over the place really, but a lot of, a lot of people coming from the coast. And so there's higher end projects and I've been fortunate to kind of be able to ride that wave and work on those projects. Um, so that's mostly what I've been doing is the new construction. 
Are there any challenges when you're working with people who are moving to a somewhat remote area like the Idaho Panhandle? Yeah, I think, um, I, I mean, as I learned when I moved here, you know, things are slower. Just the process of a lot of things is slower. It can be hard to get certain materials in a timely fashion, you know, but um, I think that's gotten a lot better. We have Small Planet Supply right over in Seattle. Um, those guys are amazing for getting tapes and whatever, all the weird things that you can't get at the <laughs> normal, normal supply houses. Um, and they can get it here quick. So, uh, that's been less and less of a problem. When I first moved here, um, zip, you know, Huber wasn't in this area yet. And that was a, that was a bummer. Cause I'm watching all these people <laughs> building these, you know, green and black houses all over the country. And there was just not really anything I could do about it unless I wanted to drive a thousand miles with a trailer and go get some good sheathing. Wow. So, <laughs> that's but, crazy to, to think that that wasn't all that long ago that uh, uh, there were many remote areas that you know during COVID people are you know started searching for those remote areas especially yep. up by you I got to think that uh, people who like nature and skiing would would love to to move to that type of an area yeah, absolutely. And, you know, at first it was, it seemed, I felt like it was frustrating that we couldn't get, you know, Huber's products and people didn't want these houses. And then, you know, I think Jake Bruton is a great example of somebody that's in a market that's not your coastal high performance market. And I kind of realized, man, this is a huge opportunity as these, as people like myself come over from the coast and are used to, you know, they know what uh, air changes per hour mean, or they, <laughs> whatever. Um, right. that's, if I can be the builder in town that is building green and black houses, uh, that's a huge advantage for me They're just cause I'm ahead on the curve on that. So that's kind of how it's been. And, uh, now it's, I feel like we're really hitting that stride, I guess. Are most of your projects architect designed or you know, designed by the homeowner or, or a, a small home designer how what, yeah, what's the most, delivery method for the projects to get to you sure yeah mostly architect designed um i'm a very small company it's just me and then i work with a couple other builders or contractors and we kind of team up to build a house i guess a custom house so we're basically one to one and a half houses a year um <laughs> and they are architect drawn with the exception of my own house, which we'll probably get into here, but uh, <laughs> I I drew that myself. But no, on the on my for profit jobs, um, it they've all been architect drawn as of late. How is that partnering with other business owners to produce one single product? You know, it's uh, it's been great for me because uh, just we're good friends and it works really well. Um, I don't know. It's yeah. I'm, I'm trying to kind of grow up and figure out if we should really be legally partnered and all that stuff. But, um, it's just, it's worked well so far and we have our, our way of doing things. It might be a little unconventional, but at the end of the day, uh, it's really easy to become a contractor in Idaho. It's a signature and a $50 check. So there's, <laughs> <laughs> there's no test or anything. And, uh, that's, you know, there's pluses and minuses to that, of course. Um, but in my experience, if you're, if you want to do good work, you're going to do good work. If you want to do the opposite, uh, you can kind of get away with that wherever you are. I mean, if it's, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a bummer, but, uh, what it does for us is it just means there's a lot of sole proprietor contractors. And so we all right. kind of work together, you know, cause it's like, why would I be an employee if I could just get my license and have some more flexibility, I guess. So have you found a, a group of other contractors that have the same interest in high performance building or pretty good house building like you do? Uh, that's been hard. There's, there's some, I mean, the main guy that I, uh, am partnered with Josh is he's into it, but he's not quite as, uh, deep into it as I am, uh, into the spreadsheets and stuff. Um, and then just recently actually through this podcast, I heard, uh, 
Joel McIntosh mentioned, and he's up in Bonners Ferry, which is about a half hour north of me. Um, and he's, he's an awesome, you know, he's got an awesome Instagram presence. And, uh, so we're going to try to hook up and start talking a little more. So that's very exciting to have someone like that. Where did this interest in building high performance homes come from for you? And is there any specific techniques that stood out to you when you saw other builders building besides uh, a lot of green and black wall <laughs> panels? <laughs> um, I don't know. I think I just have always had, uh, I think building gets boring if you're just doing the same thing day in and day out. You know, um, I like to, I like framing, I like doing trim, I like setting doors. Uh, I like all of it. And so just naturally as YouTube has gotten awesome and, uh, Instagram has, you know, turned into what it is for builders. Uh, I think the timing was just right. Uh, Nick and Tyler and the modern, modern craftsman podcast, you know, I, I used to just be inhaling those and this podcast since day one. Um, sometimes I wish there was a, a throwback with, uh, Rob and Justin and, uh, <laughs> Brian asking for more information from the, uh, well, I guess it's not this one, but the regular fine home building, but no, but really, I think the, the number one influence I would say on me being interested in this stuff is the fine home building podcast. Um, throughout the years, it's, uh, I don't know, just, I can't stop listening to it. And it's, it directs, you know, in the, the magazine as well, but, uh, directs me to cool places to look for high performance. And it's just fun to learn about and fun to build and fun to be doing things that are different every day and every job. Yeah. And sometimes you chuck random Instagram DMS out there and get people that respond to you. Right. That's, that's the craziest <laughs> thing, man, is it's like, you see, you feel like these people are these famous you included, but, uh, famous people. And then you shoot them a message and they send you a video back on some detail or whatever. It's, <laughs> it's just such an incredible thing. Really. I'm not really a social media person, but the Instagram building community is, is really special. So, yeah. Yeah. We hired, uh, another architect at TDS and, uh, -huh. uh we were celebrating the signing of a high performance house yesterday at the end of the day and uh, I was talking about the podcast and he looked at me and he's like, that's where I know your voice from. I didn't yeah. even realize it. You know, the guy had worked with us for like a month, but yeah, uh, it's, that's uh, kind of funny. Cause uh, I think you reached out to me through Instagram and was grilling me about uh, energy modeling spreadsheets, right? That's right. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. And, um, and for consulting with me on that a couple of weeks ago on getting my, my house dialed in. So yeah, appreciate that. So why do you think that builders should strive to learn these techniques? I know there, there are a lot of people out there doing them. You've mentioned a lot of podcasts and a lot of people with really good social media presence, but you know, why should builders, especially those who uh, maybe are in remote areas and may not have the the market drive for it. You know, what's the benefit to building this way in in your eyes? Um, I think the benefit is, uh, you know, I live in a pretty we're climate zone six, and uh, like I mentioned to you before the show, it's three degrees this morning, which is a little <laughs> unusual for up here. We we only have a few weeks of this per per winter, but February is usually pretty pretty cold minus 20 wind chill this morning. So, um, I, I just, I almost feel like it's not, uh, ethical might not be the right word, but it's, I just feel like it's not cool to be building a barely code minimum house when you live in a climate like this. And I'm not, I guess I'm searching for that happy medium. Um, I think the pretty good house is probably still a little bit to a little bit better than it needs to be for most builders to be practically building these houses for, you know, realistic budgets. But I certainly think we need to be doing better than uh, woven house wrap and, you know, compressed fiberglass bats and the stuff that I see all the day, all the time. There's no, there's actually no building codes in the county up here. So you, there is no uh, inspections except for mechanical. So you can imagine what 
you know, what you see sometimes in the county, especially. Um, and yeah, it's just, it, it's a real bummer when you see a brand new house being built and all they have is cadet heaters and the homeowner is <laughs> going to take on, you know, they're going to take on a $600 a month electric bill because the builder can just kind of wham, bam, pass the inspection. Okay. We have heaters in every room. Good to go on to the next, you know, and you're, it's three degrees and you're on resistance heating. So, yeah, uh, yeah. that's, that's, it, that's rough. I mean, my <laughs> gateway drug to it was practicality. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I started learning about passive house techniques and learning about a lot of the, you know, I call them the, the cool kid merit badge building materials that, you know, add a lot of cost to projects mm -hmm. and yeah, they, they make sense in certain areas, but I, I really did a deep dive in, you know, how can I do this in the most practical, low cost way, doing things that I already know how to do. Um, in the, the little bit that I've talked to you outside this taping, I, I've gotten a lot of the same uh, feel from you of, you know, how, mm -hmm. how can I build the best house that I can with my abilities without breaking the bank? Yeah, that's exactly true for me personally. I, I was super fortunate to work on a just a monster, beautiful timber frame um, here in town a couple years ago. And, uh, we had a, you know, energy consultant out of Boise and, uh, it was awesome. We did three and a half inches of exterior graphite EPS and a double <laughs> rain screen and all this stuff, it just phenomenal house. Um, but I, I kind of call it the massive passive because it was, it was supposed to be close to passive house. Um, but there were so many things that I just felt were, uh, cool, but not a very practical way to do it. Not a really long lasting way to do it necessarily. And, uh, yeah, it, it fit the computer model, but I, I won't really want to, that's what my house is, is my, it's my version of a pretty good house, I guess. And I really like the idea of the pretty good house and, uh, maybe the almost pretty good house too, to be totally realistic, you know? Yeah. So tell us about your build. Where, where did you come up with the idea to do it? And, uh, you know, how did some of these, you know, massive passive type projects <laughs> inform that, that design since you already outed yourself as the, the designer and builder of this. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, well, yeah, we, uh, we made the move. We were living about 45 minutes out of Sandpoint, outside of Sandpoint. And, uh, I have a three-year-old daughter and she's starting school and we just realized it was time to be a little closer to town and not be driving so much. So, uh, we picked up a piece of dirt and, uh, it was kind of a, it's a sloped lot, kind of a technical build site. Um, and then prices were through the, this is about a year ago. Um, prices were through the roof. So we said, okay, we're going to build a rectangle with a shed roof. Um, Luckily, that style's kind of in right now up here. We call it mountain <laughs> modern. Um, maybe it's in with everybody just because of uh, prices. But anyway, four corners, simple roof. Um, and from there, just kind of, yeah, value engineering everything. We're doing a uh, double two by four, double stud wall. Um, I did the ICF, you know, the footers and ICF stem walls myself that was the first time i had done much concrete work um hydronic slab and uh yeah i don't know we could get into specifics from there but uh that's that's the gist of it is build something simple uh the project i had just come off of was one of the most complex foundations i've ever seen and a six you know two 16 12 gables with curved fascia and <laughs> you talk about hard to detail and hard to uh, just hard to how do you do. even waterproof <laughs> that right how do you how do you flash something like that to uh yeah to shed water sticky, properly a lot of sticky things on top of each other i guess <laughs> and a and a 16 12 pitch that you're hoping is going to send anything and everything flying off that roof right yep yeah yeah exactly so how did you come up with the, the design? Was it driven by budget? Were you budget first? And then what can we do for X amount of money? Or uh, did you kind of have the, the mountain modern idea to start and then built your budget around that? Yeah, um, 
I guess both budget is very important. Um, I think it's good as a, as a builder too, to build your own house and <laughs> really build in some <laughs> empathy for the people that you're working for, um, in yep. the future, because yeah, you really, it really hurts when you're spending your own money. So, um, it's good to remember that. Um, so yeah, budget was, budget was first. Um, there were some, I would say restrictions due to the site, due to the neighborhood. Uh, it does have an HOA, so there was some things there. So we basically did all the bare minimums for that as far as the size of the house and needing to have a garage and stuff like that. Um, and then I just kept drawing pencil and paper over and over and over and kept tweaking. And, uh, and then as we started building, basically threw all that away and just started <laughs> making it up as we went as the plumber was roughing it in um, <laughs> how many different sketches did you go through that uh didn't quite meet the the demands that you guys were looking for mm, at least a handful <laughs> of different floor <laughs> plans um you know just trying to i mean like you said earlier about working with an architect and stuff tr if there's so many variables you're kind of like okay do i want to make this thing the tightest uh you know, no window box that I can No, Do I want to, you know, can I have, I have views to the North, you know? And so I have a lot of glazing on the North. It's not a great idea, but I want to look to the North. I've got neighbors to the yep. South. Um, there's just things like that and weighing those back and forth. Do I want to stack my walls so that my plumbing goes straight down or can I, you know, have things kind of centralized, but also maximize the space for, usable efficiency um and it, it's just it's non non-stop ongoing throughout the build i guess so what uh did you put in for windows i think you said you you've got it all dried in right now uh, as we were talking before the show so what what uh, type of high performance windows did you go with <laughs> well uh we went with marvin essentials um i'm kind of in a I'm in a place where I'm not sure what the best, you know, medium level window is. Uh, I've always liked Marvin. Um, I feel like they've, you never really hear anybody say anything bad about Marvin's. Um, in our area here, we have Marvin, Milgard, and Anderson. Those are kind of the three um, in Sierra Pacific to a certain extent. And I'm kind of in a, you know, we've, we've used all three and I'm comparing them all apples to apples as I put them in on different jobs. And, um, it's kind of hard to, hard to pick a favorite there, but I'm, I'm pretty happy with the Marvins. Um, there's been a few things that it were kind of, uh, I don't know, not my favorite, I guess on the install, but overall I think they're yeah. a solid window. So, um, and high performance, not really, you know, they're, they're decent as far as that goes, but, uh, I was running actually through your energy model that you shared with me. Um, when you start upping the window to, you know, triple pane and stuff and stuff, it makes some changes, but the cost for the cost comparison yeah. is you start going, okay, it doesn't line years up, right? to pay that off. <laughs> <laughs> and it's hard to justify that. So, yeah, yeah I, I used the same windows for my house, and that, that was a loaded question uh, yeah. asking you that since <laughs> I already knew that was the direction you were going. But sure, uh, it, it ends up being a trade-off, right? You know, anytime you're you're building, like you said, you've got these all these different decisions that you have to make, and you have to think about where's your return on investment. Are are you really is this the best way to spend money? Uh, you know, you can make that small box with no windows and that would be the the highest performing house but you wouldn't want to live in it right yep yeah exactly yeah so where and did I, i'm sorry go ahead i was just going to ask you how the how else the energy model informed what you were doing uh if it informed the double stud walls or any of the other uh parts of your assembly you know the double stud walls uh as i was deciding that that was the thing and how how deep I was going to go. Uh, they're 12 inch, um, or 11 and seven eighths, but that was fine. Home building came out with that double stud issue, uh, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. And that was right when I was thinking about that. So that was pretty much what sold me on that. Um, 
And the energy model, I didn't really get that thing totally dialed until recently with you. Um, so that it didn't, didn't inform it too much. It was kind of, you know, like I said, the windows was a budget driven decision. Um, a lot of fixed windows, a lot of casements as well. Um, one of my neighbors mentioned that in the afternoon, cause we're on a hill, he said, Oh man, the, the cool air comes down the hill in the afternoon. So I, changed all my casements to scoop the air coming down the hill. That was kind of a, a good tip from a neighbor who I actually built the house for uh, four years ago. Or helped Have you build experienced the house. that now that you've got it tried in? Have you <laughs> opened up the windows and felt that coming down the hill? Man, it's, it's three degrees. I don't want to open the windows <laughs> right now. <laughs> No, I haven't. Uh, I haven't been hanging out up there in the evenings, uh, nor wanted to get any more cold air. I've been trying to keep them as closed as possible so far. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that we did with our house was we have pretty significant crosswinds in a few different directions, mm -hmm. and we we lined individual casements up to kind of suck that wind through the house, mm -hmm. uh, wind tunnel style, because we have such a big open area. Uh, how did you lay out your floor plan inside the house? Is it the, when I hear mountain modern, I think of kind of like what I built where you've got a big open room and uh, maybe bedrooms tucked away to the side. That's, that's, that uh, describes it perfectly. Um, we wanted the, the East is the sun rises here. Um, we're on daybreak drive. So it's uh, the sun rises <laughs> is where it's at. Um, so the East wall is the kind of, uh, dining room area and then the kitchen is facing that um, and like I said I like to cook so huge kitchen going into a medium-sized great room but they're it's all connected <laughs> um, big island big dining table uh, hoping to have lots of people eating in the giant room and then the bedrooms are our the primary bedroom our bedroom is basically a California king with the 32 inch you know, minimum walking around the bed side. It's, it's just a bedroom. It's not nothing more than that. Um, so it was all about the kitchen. <laughs> Have you had any challenges specific to the high performance aspect of it that you've had to tackle while you were building or did your experience in doing other high performance projects first, uh, help you through some of those details? Um, the biggest, the biggest challenge is the HVAC system, uh, just in general. Um, you know, I have some amazing subs up here. Uh, HVAC is really, really hard to find good guys. I have good guys, but they don't necessarily want to talk about, um, I think I'm going to go with the space pack system and try to do kind of an all in one and, uh, less refrigerant running inside the house or no refrigerant. Um, and yeah, guys just don't even want to look at it. And, uh, it's unfortunate cause I'm probably going to have to do it myself, which is fine, but, um, it's, uh, I wish I had a little more help in that aspect. So yeah, the HVAC has been the hardest, everything else. Um, my electricians way into high performance. And, uh, so he's, I just have to keep telling them I can't afford the full smart home. That's the biggest issue there. <laughs> I was just going to ask you if you're going to do the smart electric panels so you can in real time follow your <sighs> usage. And I do have a sense, a sense monitor, um, you know, that app, uh, which I've done some stuff with, but, uh, I, I don't think we're going to have the full, uh, smart switches and smart lighting things in the budget. Um, I'm, I'm still on the fence. I would love to do just, just the great room and kitchen, but, uh, yeah, it doesn't, it's not looking like it right now. So that's okay. You said you're doing double stud walls. What are you putting in them? It'll be 12 inches of cellulose. Um, it's just regular zip, not zip bar on the outside. Uh, and the roof is a shed roof, you know, single pitch, uh, parallel cord bridge trusses one in 12. Um, and we're looking to get, it should, I mean, I'm thinking we're going to be about R40 in the walls and close to R90 or hundred with uh, cellulose in the roof. Um, so that's what we're shooting for on that. That's a pretty good amount of, uh, R value in the roof I and mean, you're probably scratching what passive house would want you to do for your area, right? 
Yeah, I guess I haven't really, I haven't even really gone on the passive house rabbit hole because I know I'm, uh, well, yeah, I might be getting there. <laughs> I am doing uh, something that a lot of people are, this is, I guess, a challenge and I don't know if I would do it again, but maybe, maybe not, but we're going to sheath the bottom of our trusses with OSB, tape the seams and then run uh, two by threes or something as strapping um, perpendicular to the trusses. And then we'll run most of our electrical in that inch and a half cavity. Uh, that throws everything off because I had to have my plumber run all of his vents and stub them six inches down. Mm -hmm. uh, and then basically I'm keeping everything. I'm using a Zender HRV, so uh, don't have bath fans up in there. But um, trying to keep the minimum number of big penetrations up in the ceiling. Um I think it's going to be pretty cool, but definitely when you tell the subs, oh, yeah, they're insulating tomorrow. And, uh, you know, they're like, why do we have to do this partial one quarter of our rough in and then get it inspected? <laughs> and the, the electrical inspector came the other day and I only have three wires up there, you know, gutter heaters and some soffit lighting. And uh, he's kind of going, where's the <laughs> what am I inspecting? So where's the rest? That's been of unusual, it? <laughs> but yeah, exactly. Um, but I think it'll. I think it'll be a, a pretty cool system, I guess. Yeah, the house that we have coming up for TDS, that's one of the things that we're looking at doing uh, is putting the uh, OSB with taped seams on the ceiling and using that as our, our air barrier. I've seen Ben Bogey do that on, on other mm -hmm. houses. I, I think the, the article that he did that you referenced before with the double mm -hmm. studs, uh, that was on a house that he did in Maine that I visited before I built mine. And I believe he did that, that detail there. And it, yeah. it, it makes sense once you think all the way through it, but I can only imagine what building inspectors think when they, <laughs> they show up to look at your three wires and then you explain the, that you're going to do the lid with OSB and put everything else below that. Yeah. Uh, how did, how did that end up influencing your lighting plan and some of the other uh, mechanical work that you have to do in that assembly? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is the, uh, I mean, the just the biggest penetrations we have is going to be the uh, hood fan ducting. Um, I've got an eight inch exhaust and a 10 inch return. I'm going to basically use chases in the pantry to run those down into the floor and they'll come in and out below the deck, um, which comes off of the side of the house. So that's a big penetration I didn't have to go through the lid with. Um, we are doing a wood stove, which is a, you know, counterintuitive thing on a house like this, but we just <laughs> couldn't give it up. We live in the forest and uh, love wood heat. And so that they've already installed the uh, box for that. That'll get all air sealed to the OSB, obviously. Um, but other than that, it's been pretty easy. Lighting wise, I think we'll throw some blocks in for things like ceiling fans if we choose to do those. Um, but between pancake boxes and all the you know wafer LED down lights um, or can lights, there's not a whole lot you need to stick way up into your attic anymore. It's, it's awesome. So if you had another builder who didn't know anything about high performance building or never read the uh, pretty good house book uh, yeah. come in and ask you like well what how, how much more is this costing you know in time and and oh. money you know, would, <laughs> would you even have an answer or or know where to uh where to direct a contractor for that you know uh like you i'm trying to keep good track of this stuff obviously i'm not charging for myself so it's it, you know you have to factor that side of it um i don't have a good answer for that because i think i would be overly optimistic um i'd probably say that i could do a you know a better house for 10 to 15 percent more but i think that's really just me wanting to think that i could and i i don't know yet i haven't done enough of them to uh to have a good a good grip on that yeah, I've yeah. I found in building mine that my free in quotation labor sure. uh, really offsets so much of the cost. And <laughs> I think it's you know if, if somebody was going to pay you and your uh, 
your contractor friends that you partner with to build a house like this, I, I got to imagine it would be very similar to you know, what somebody would be paying a, a full service company to, to do it. it. It's such a huge upcharge in labor and extra work. And uh, it adds some complexity too, right? You mentioned the mm -hmm. HVAC contractors building a house like this can end up limiting your, your subcontractor pool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I have the advantage as the homeowner that I can, I can perform whatever I want as the homeowner. Um, right. So, you know, that's great, but that's not going to be the case on the next project that I, you know, as I say, my for profit projects. Um, <laughs> I think though, that just again, being in a, an emerging high performance market, just the fact that we, we'll only use zip or, or similar products and stuff like that. We, that's now just a standard. Um, we're right. not going to, we're not going to tie back your house. Um, that in itself is kind of one step up. And even if we're like the next house I'm building this summer is going to be two by six walls. I'll be pushing for dense pack cellulose rather than, uh, than fiberglass or what have you, you know, that might be a little more, but really, just to go a step in the right direction isn't that isn't that expensive. Um, getting it down below one air change or something like that is that's a conversation with the homeowner. And you know, do you guys really care about this on a four thousand square foot house or or not? Um, <laughs> with a bunch of so, dormers and little wings yeah. <laughs> off of the, all the actually, the luckily my next floor plans. my next project is a really cool one, and it's also mountain modern. It's actually very similar to my house, so um, I'm excited to bring what I can to that and, uh, and, but be practical, you know, they're, they're cool people and they don't have unlimited money and it's, uh, it's going to be a good, a good project. I'm excited about it. Do you look at projects like this one in your own home as proof of concept that as you grow as a builder in the area, you've got these examples of things that you executed and you can bring people to your house or, show them other homes that you've built and explain the the benefits of maybe why instead of two by six, you should think about doing a, a double stud wall and have some yeah. actual cost data to go over with. Yeah, uh, that's a hundred percent. I think that's the most exciting thing about doing this build for myself. I mean, having a new house is going to be awesome, but, um, <laughs> I think, I think just what you said is, is so true. Being able to say, here's what this looks like. You know, here's things you got to think about when you have a 12 inch wall, how, how your French doors open, how wide do they open? <laughs> uh, you know, what are the options to do that? Um, so that's, that's absolutely true. And, uh, it's nice to have homeowners, especially first time homeowners be able to come and touch and feel and see, because it, it really is hard for people that, um, are doing it for the first time to see that concept in space, you know, before or even after they have plans drawn to, to know what, what a casement window is even, or things like that, you know? Right. So, um, yeah, that's a very exciting aspect and, um, it's a little scary, certain thing. Like I mentioned the space pack, I'm a little bit like, ah, oh, there's not many of those out there, but it seems like <laughs> a really cool thing. And, um, so we'll see how that goes. I'll report back. <laughs> Yeah, no, it'll be interesting to see how the project finishes out. And you've you've started posting some things on your Instagram feed, going over some of the the work that you're doing, but the yep. the feed hasn't quite caught up to where you are right now, right? Yeah, I'm trying to keep it kind of chronological, but I'm also a uh, I'm just terrible at posting, so I'm trying to get better. I I did a few <laughs> in anticipation of this podcast, so maybe I'll I'll try to keep it nice. coming. <laughs> nice. So it's been yeah. great having you on, Keegan. Is there anything else that you want to tell or ask the audience before we go? Um, yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's a, it's an honor. And uh, I think just it's the trades are awesome, man. Like I said, Monday to Friday is nice. Being home is, you know, you know, working where you live is nice. Uh, it's transferable. You can do it in any town in the country. Um we have harsh winters, but uh, we figure out ways to do it, and I'm sure you guys do too. too. Um, yeah, I I love what I do every single day. I absolutely love it. So um, if if one person gets into it because of that, that'd be awesome. 
That's great. Thank you to Keegan for taking the time to join me today. And thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us wherever you're listening. It helps others find the podcast. Thanks again for listening, everybody, and keep craft alive.